being... Hi, good morning, everybody. So we're on Discover Energy Work, and I've taken the advantage um, of knowing, uh, for me, a hero, uh, a hero, certainly a war hero of the Cold War, um, Lynn Buchanan, who was... Lynn, I would say, was one of the inspirations for uh, many um, TV... Um, portrayals of people doing psychic work um, and um, being psychic detectives, psychic spies. Uh, and even in the um, Men Who Stare at Goats film, the uh, George Clooney plays a character who I think, actually, I think a little bit debunky uh, in that idea, sort of making fun of it, uh, is called Lynn. Um, but uh, that's, that's a whole other issue. And um, Lynn... Buchanan, well, the reason I was just talking to Lynn, I was saying, you know, the reason that uh, Discover Energy Work, uh, I'm doing this is that to help us realize we have another dimension to our existence. And then we're not just physical, we're not just energy, we're, we're something else as well. And many years ago, I learned with Lynn, uh, controlled remote viewing in Germany. And I, I've always been the memory of those classes is always really stuck in my memory. So um, my teacher, um, a little bit my hero, um, controlled remote viewer of a top secret uh, program, Lynn Buchanan. Good morning, good evening. Good evening, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you so much for coming on. I feel like I've got royalty um, as far as the... Again. Hmm? Good to see you. Good to see you again. Yeah, well, yeah, it's been uh, it's been some time. Yeah. Although I do watch you on your uh, you you're really, as I said, like you've been on coast to coast, haven't you? Um, you've been on the um, the show um, Mish Loves. Um, oh yeah, uh, again, thinking aloud. Thinking aloud, which is like. Uh, you know, as I say, that's that's a very uh, prestigious show, I think. Yes. Uh, they show that in, um, when I was doing my psychology degree, they would use his videos and his interviews. He's interviewed, like, you know, incredible people. So, um, yeah, of which you are one. So, um, Lynn, I've got some questions for you. And okay. we got... We're going to follow the questions, but I, I've also got some extra questions because I think having the opportunity to talk to you is just so fantastic. So if you go back before, you know, your secret program and you think of the very first time that you experienced energy, would that be like in your childhood? Can you, can you tell me about that? Well, yeah, actually, um, um, when I was about 12 years old, uh, I was out playing after school with a bunch of other guys, and we were throwing rocks at this big, huge metal plate that was leaning, leaning up against a brick wall. I mean, huge metal plate. And uh, uh, we were throwing rocks at the plate, and it would, of course, make a loud sound and all that. Yeah, and uh, one of those rocks that I threw, I threw it, and I heard a voice say, "Go through." And the next sound I heard was the rock hitting the brick wall behind the metal plate, but it didn't hit the plate. And uh, the other guys saw it, and they said it just went through. Right. And so we all went up and looked, and there was the rock between the metal plate and the wall. It had gone through, but there was no hole, anything like that. Um, you know, you're I'm, so brave to talk about it, um, because... Well, I'm, yeah, I'm the kind that gets curious about everything, and so I wanted to know what happened. Right. So I started paying attention, and uh, little things happened again and again and again. And I started sort of keeping record of them, hmm. when they happened, how they happened, and all that. And hmm. pretty soon, I was trying to develop it. Uh, 
So that was what? about 12 years old. Wow, 12 years old. And so there was no special like physical feeling. You just said, oh, the, the voice said, go through. So have you ever thought wh whose voice it was? I think it was mine, right. but I don't know. <laughs> uh, I know that later it sort of came to be, um, I would think the command and things would happen, you know. Mm. Uh, so I guess it was the voice of my subconscious mind. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, um, I, I can imagine, well, I was actually just watching um, the Yuri Geller in, interview on Gaia. And, uh, you know, he, he builds up to telling a story where he says, okay, like this is really like um, something that's going to be difficult for everybody to believe, but stuff has materialized, stuff has like gone through physical materialization. He, he talks about him, um, uh, I'll, I'll use the word teleporting, but I mean, he, he dematerialized and rematerialized somebody else, somewhere else, according to his story. And what I love about you is you're just matter of fact, you just go, well, this like, this is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I like suck it up. <laughs> you know, on that instance, as far as I know, I didn't feel like I had anything to do with it at all. I just threw a rock. <laughs> right. Right. Amazing. And there, there's been a lot of um, occurrences of um, this like um, fluidity or flexibility of, of matter that, you know, um, there's stories about yeah. uh, Shaolin monks walking through walls and, um, you know, in, in history. And uh, there's even, um, I went to see this monk um, in China who's sitting in meditation posture and he hasn't, he hasn't decayed. And it's 1,700 years ago that yeah. he sat down. Yeah, and he, he looks in pristine condition. And um, yeah. He should be rested by now. Exactly. You think, oh, all right, you've had a rest now. <laughs> Time to get up. So did it change your life, this experience with, like, did it change the way you saw the world at, at 11? Or? Uh, not really. Uh, not really at that time. But as I worked it and as I learned how to use it and learned how to do it, um, yeah, it opened my mind a lot to to different possibilities then uh i guess about a year and a half later uh i was showing off to the pretty little red-headed girl you know i think i know her oh yes uh, <laughs> sure say love them right <laughs> and uh and was showing her one of the things i could do and uh that I had learned how to do. And she was very impressed and went home and told her father, the Pentecostal preacher. But and, what did uh, you show her? I mean, like when I would be showing well, a little redheaded girl to... something, it would be probably not repeatable on, on air. No, I had uh, learned how to put a pebble on a metal pie pan and lift up the pie pan and the pebble would fall to the ground but it wouldn't make a hole in the pie pan. Right. And uh, uh, I had learned how to do that. And so anyway, the next day, um, I was walking home from school and I met her father and uh, three of the deacons of his church. Right. And they acted very interested. That was, oh, that was really neat trick. How can you do that? Could you show us? And he produced a pie, plan, a pie pan and a rock of his own. And I took it and did it. And immediately they threw me down to the ground, held my head to the sidewalk and was screaming for Satan to come out of me and, and you know, unpossess this child. Mm. And it scared me half to death. And, uh, you know, I was raised in the deep south if the preacher said it, then God obviously said it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so I tried and tried and tried for years 
to never let anything like that happen again. Mm. But at certain instances, it would happen. And uh, so you shrugged I, your shoulders when you said that. Was it like it would just happen, but you wouldn't try and make it happen? Yeah, I wouldn't try to make it happen. Right, yet, right. But it would. Mm. And uh, then this is the part that was shown in The Men Who Stare at Goats, where uh, there was a computer program that I had written over six months time, and uh, it was to tie the computers of 17 different countries together so that they could talk to each other in that secure facility with intelligence information. Mm. And uh, this other sergeant had wanted to do the program, but um, I got selected to do it and he was very jealous. And so uh, I was up starting to show the program. I, we had all these high ranking generals there in the room. And so I went to comb my hair make sure that my uniform was spotless and all this. And I came back, started my presentation. And uh, after I did my little introduction, I turned around to the computer and hit the enter key. And the computer went dead. And all these generals started chuckling and laughing. And uh, I turned around and this other sergeant was standing at the doorway and he mouthed, gotcha and turned around grinned and turned around and walked off mm. i got flaming mad and when i did all of the computers all of the intelligence computers in the field station went down mm. uh, for an amount of time that is still classified uh come to find out the intelligence computers in all of West Germany went down at the same time, German and American. Uh, the intelligence computers of the other countries went down. Uh, it wasn't until years later that I found out that all of the intelligence computers in East Germany went down too. <laughs> wow. And, uh, they never found a cause for it. Um, I knew what had happened, but I wasn't about to say it. You know, I yeah. could see my great, great grandchildren paying for computers. But um, <laughs> one of the people who was in the room that day was a um, was under the command of uh, General Stubblebein, yeah, who was head of the Intelligence and Security Command. He had been looking for people with PK ability. He believed in it strongly. Psychokinetic. And, yeah, psychokinetic ability. And uh, so that officer reported me to the general who was back in Washington. Well, about a month later, the general came out to the field station to install a new commander of the field station. When he came out, he asked to see me and he took me off into the new commander's new office yeah told the new commander get out i want to talk to sergeant buchanan <laughs> which, put full me, <laughs> which put me at the top of guess what list for you know, yeah the, like, the time i was there and uh, and he scowled and he got up in my face just like in the in the movie did you kill my computers with your mind? And I was going to deny it. And I just sort of heard myself say, yes, sir, I did. And he said, far effing out, have I ever got a job for you? He took me back to Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, he wanted to start a unit where we would train people to mentally affect enemy computers. Right. Congress, Congress would not fund that. And so he took me out to the remote viewing unit. He had nothing else to do with me. He took me out to the remote viewing unit, put me in, and there I was. 
So at that point, like you, you kind of were the um, person that that broke things with your mind, as it were, for, for them. Well, in broke that computers. Instance, yeah. In that instance, yeah. Yeah, and but, then um, and then what happened was finally they said, "Well, we we've got this guy. He's obviously got some special psychic abilities." we'll put him in the remote viewing uh, unit, right. which was at Fort Meade, was it? That's right. And the remote viewing unit had the uh, edict that they were for intelligence collection only and was never to even try doing anything, any active mental work. So uh, the whole time I was there, uh, any PK ability and anything like that was absolutely forbidden. Okay, okay. So you you must have um, um, you must have arrived there, um, and then they started training you. So um, was that Ingo that you, did you go and meet Ingo? No, the week before uh, I got to the unit, Ingo lost his contract, and so uh, I was taught by the people in the unit whom he had trained. Right. Now, it was later when I got to know Ingo and become a friend of his, and uh, I never got formal training from Ingo, but we had, you know, over coffee and all this, we had so many. Yeah. Uh, I learned so much from Ingo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so um, uh, you, you had all that training, and then... Um, you must have, it's kind of interesting for me because you must have like, you got this ability to um, affect things with your mind. At that time, it wasn't, it was a natural ability. It got scared away um, through like a traumatic, you know, I say religion experience, not religious experience. Um, yeah. And then, and then this, through this freak situation in, in, um, in Germany, yeah. in Germany, it reappears, and then you're yeah. taken, not really knowing that much about your own ability. So, uh, when was the moment? Do you remember that? I mean, I know you can't talk about anything which was mm -hmm. which is still classified or was classified, or, and I don't want you to. I mean, oh, like well. you joke with me, you said I can tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Yeah. So well, I can I can tell you the first. It wasn't a classified thing at all. Right. Um, right. I, when I was taken into the unit, they read me on, which is where they, uh, they don't speak it. They have it written out on a piece of paper that you have to sign. Right. That tells you what the unit really does instead of what the public thinks you do, the, the unit does. Right. You read that and it ends with, you know, if you reveal any of this, there will be uh, ten thousand dollar fine and ten years in prison. Sign here. <laughs> mm. And so I read it and I thought, they're kidding. The military doesn't do this. And I had read it. I signed, and then I started watching the people there working, and they were doing it. And uh, I thought that's amazing, but I can't do that. You know, mm. never seen anything like it. Mm. They would sit down and uh, draw maps of places halfway around the world, pretty accurate maps. Yeah. And, uh, and tell what was going on at each place on the map. And uh, so then one day it came my turn to be, you know, I was in training and it came my turn to do a real target. And uh, they had this stack of envelopes of um, locations in that, that area around Fort Meade. And so uh, the uh, two of the other people in the unit randomly picked a sealed envelope, got in the car and drove off away from the place so that we couldn't see which way they went or anything like that, you know, from wherever they opened the envelope. Mm. They opened the envelope and looked at the destination they were to go to. They gave uh, 
we had a 15 minute waiting time. And then I was to sit down and describe the location around them. Mm. And uh, so <clears throat> I kept getting them looking out the window like this and driving by and just constantly driving and, and just kept looking out the window and that's all I got. And so they said, well, you know, you, you failed. <laughs> and uh, so the two came back afterwards and, uh, and they said, okay, what was the location you went to? And they said, well, here was the location, but we never found it. We just kept driving around. <laughs> <looking for it. laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden I thought, this works. <laughs> yes. Yes. So that right. was so, my that was my first convincing experience, you know. Right. So like it was um it I remember um, um I, I felt like the controlled remote viewing that you showed me was something that you, you don't need somebody else to convince you when you start doing it, you get right. feedback, which you go, wow, yeah. it didn't feel like anything special. It didn't feel like anything psychic. I just, I just got these impressions sort of thing. That's it. it uh, um, I think the best way to explain it is your subconscious mind is psychic just naturally. Yeah. Your conscious mind is not. So a good analogy is that your subconscious mind is a tin can, your conscious mind is a tin can, and you can scream all you want to into either one and the other one won't hear it, but you connect a string in between, pull it tight, and all of a sudden anything said in one room in one can, tin can can be heard in the other. The controlled remote viewing that they teach you is not in any way in and of itself psychic. It's a, um, it's a method that lets your two minds talk to each other. And right. um, just like, you know, the difference between the two tin cans and a string and today's modern cell phone, over the years, they have improved it and improved it and improved it the telephone that was all tinny sounding and now then it sounds perfectly clear. And uh, the controlled remote viewing that Ingo did, that Ingo created, was actually created almost 70 years ago now. And wow. over all that time, we have been um, perfecting it to where the signal between the two minds is clearer and clearer and clearer. Mm. Mm. And uh, we're learning that the human mind can do amazing things, just fantastically amazing things. So yes. well, you, you, you say that, um, do you want to elaborate? I mean, <clears throat> what, what do you, what's the most amazing thing that, I mean, there probably isn't one. If you you don't have to. I don't have to tie oh, you down yeah. one. <laughs> the job I had, yeah, uh, there were countless ones. Uh, I don't know. There were the astounding ones. There were the ones I'm proudest of. There were the ones that saved saved lives. There were ones that uh, were just pure, purely interesting because they were so new. Well, right. I mean, really, your book, uh, The Seventh Sense, I could make a plug for that because it's just, you go, you tell us a lot of, like, incredible stories. Yeah. Um, you know, true, oh, I call them war stories. It's like war stories of a war we, you know, you're an unsung hero. I call you a war, an unsung war hero. Like, people don't mm -hmm. realize you've saved, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. You don't know about through that. The well, I know you're very modest, but I mean, like through the um, through the unit and through the um, intelligence that was gathered, and people making decision on that that intelligence, it's definitely um, safe. There was only one session that we had that I am firmly believe I'm a firm believer saved 
millions of lives, but that was that one session. But uh, can, you, you, can you tell you us know, about we, it or? Uh, sort of, yeah. But all the others were, you know, we would work for a unit and we would tell that unit what to do, what not to do. So we may have saved one or two lives at a time. I don't know. Right. Um, I was doing a session one day and um, uh, it was plans and intentions uh, during the Cold War. And uh, uh, we always worked blind. I had no idea what the target was. I just knew it was an operational target, you know. Yeah. And so uh, I was working along and all of a sudden that same voice came and it said, you're not going to believe what comes next. And I thought, well, that's strange, you know. Yeah. And I was in the room alone, uh, working alone. And um, so anyway, I went back to the session and what came next, I, I found it hard to believe that the person that I was uh, uh, targeted with getting the plans and intentions for uh, had a missile, an American missile, and was going to lob it into the Holy of Holies there in the Feast of Ramadan where all of the leaders were, you know, where they go around the Hajj. Uh, in Mecca. Yeah, in Mecca, and um, kill everyone. And then he was going to be absent that day. And then he would be the leader left to rule the entire Arab world in a war against the U.S. We could not have won. Hmm. There's no, there was no way we could not have won. And uh, come to find out, uh, I was viewing the plans and intentions of Saddam Hussein. Right. And I could not believe that any Arab would do that. You know, any Muslim would do that. But um, from what I, from intel that I got as feedback later, they did find a captured U.S. missile in the possession of a Muslim terrorist group that was aimed at Mecca and just sitting there waiting. And did so? Did you give them the coordinates? I mean, people probably don't realize that the control remote viewing can douse coordinates and say, well, like, start there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, the coordinate system, Ingo Swan said that he could uh, remote view any remote view with accuracy any location on Earth down to 10 feet. And so they would give him geographic coordinates so that they could pinpoint it on the map. He would view what was there and he proved that he could do it. Right. So he taught people using geographic coordinates. Well, when it came into the unit to be used as an intelligence collection routine, um, you know, if we were looking for um, enemy installations, if we were looking for missing soldiers or whatever, we didn't have the geographic coordinates. <laughs> so how would you, I mean, I know that, you know, from your well, book and talking with you. With a, they came up with a really neat idea and that was to not let the viewer know that it wasn't geographic coordinates. Ingo has always given us coordinates of uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds. Right. North, you know, longitude and latitude. So it wound up always two lines of six digit numbers. Hmm. And so they just started randomly giving us two lines of six digit numbers and it worked. <laughs> and so uh, over the years, they started giving us uh, just random numbers. They started giving us uh, letters and numbers, um, things like that. And they all work right. um, for a remote viewer. And uh, what we do now for training purposes, uh, we found that if you give two targets with the same number, the subconscious mind of the viewer will tend to mix them together. 
even though one is a year away from the other, uh, they'll mix them together on both of them. Anyway, um, the uh, what we do now for trainers is for training students is we give a six digit date and that date is not going to happen again for another hundred years. Right. If that viewer is still around a hundred years from now, we'll have to figure out something else. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But my question was more about if you are asked to locate um, uh, the, the American missiles of that time, you would then, there are methods in control remote viewing to, to, no. No. Uh, this is one of the problems of, re, of controlled remote viewing. You can give me coordinates down to a 10, down to a one foot radius, okay? Anywhere on earth, and I'll tell you what's there. But you target me with that and ask me where it is, I can't give you the coordinates. <laughs> uh, one right, of the things but there have been, there have been uh, instances where you found uh, you've got names of towns of, of oh, kidnappers yeah. and... Yeah, yeah and, uh, and we do that by describing what's there and then depending on an analyst or somebody who lives around there right. to say, oh, I know where that is. Okay. But, um, uh, psychics and um, remote viewers of all kinds uh, just have trouble with letters and numbers. Even a psychic will say, oh, the street, I don't know what street it is, but it starts with an S, but they can't give you the rest of the numbers, the letters, you know? Right. Yes, I mean we do we do hear that, and that's that's why um, sometimes psychics get a bit of a bad uh, deal when they they sort of say, "Well, that's I think it's, like, it's John yeah. or Jeanette." It's like you know, yeah. Um, yeah so um, that was that was a, the story of of a session where potentially, um, not potentially, uh, well, yeah, I think we have to talk potentially millions of lives but was there a life-changing session that you had was there a, a session where you said this has really changed me as a person absolutely um i had been doing the bad guys uh foreign leaders and uh, foreign leaders criminals um uh, um uh, uh military groups that uh abduct children and use them for ungodly purposes, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so I had been doing that every day for a long time. And one day I went in and I said, look, give me Mother Teresa, give me Bozo the Clown, yeah. give me somebody, but this is killing me. And uh, Right, so you're experiencing like a, a, a transference just by psychically going to these people. And, and tired of dealing with that kind of person. Right. And um, so the director said, you're a soldier, suck it up and do your damn job. Okay. Fair comment, fair comment. Yeah, and I went back to work. Well, anyway, about a week or so later, there was no activity or anything like that. So I was taken over to do a, um, uh, you can do a personality assessment where you describe their personality. You can also do a plans and intentions where you get into their mind and find their actual plans and intentions. So they took me over and they said, okay, we're doing a personality assessment today. Okay, you're going to give me one of these again, you know. Mm. And uh, so I started the session, and right off, I thought, no, you've given me the wrong person. And I said, I said, I don't think this is a bad guy. And, of course, the envelope was sealed. Uh, the monitor didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. And so... Uh, 
So the monitor said, well, it's a task, go ahead and do it. I didn't know whether I was doing a practice target or a, an operation or what. And uh, so I started working. And as I worked, I just got this, this wonderful glow of a feeling. And um, there is a situation in remote viewing where all of your senses, it's called bilocation, where mm. all of your senses suddenly work their way to the target and you cannot tell you're not at the target. You cannot tell that you're sitting at a desk doing this paperwork. Right. And uh, that happened. And uh, I came out of the session and my total summary was, whatever evil you think this guy did, he didn't do it. This is not a bad guy. Mm. And I was glowing and it was just, I never met anybody like that in my life. And so the monitor said, okay, well, we're going to see who the target is. He tore the envelope open and the director had handwritten on a sheet of paper, Jesus. And right. in that remote viewing way, I, I can say, you know, I met him for real. Right. And uh, it changed my life. It really did. Can you describe how, how it changed your life? Yeah, all of the stuff that I had learned that was true in Sunday school became true. Right. All of the stuff that I had learned in Sunday school and church that was false became very clearly false. Mm. And I, I really learned the difference between Christianity and church doctrine, churchianity. Mm. And, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, I saw myself as I really was, <laughs> wow. which is not always a very pleasant experience. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know. Humbling, humbling experience, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it changes your life, yeah. I, I feel um, it's, it's interesting because I talk to, um, if I get the chance, I talk to, you know, people like you who've had an experience which I call, it, it, I want to almost call it beyond energy work. It's sort of another level of energy work at least. Um, and they, I would say nearly everybody says that they start to know, just know things. Um, and it's, um, that seems to be one of the common threads, you know, when well, you speak yes. to them. Uh, one of the things we found about controlled remote viewing, as you practice it and study it, and you establish that line of communications with your subconscious, it talks to you all the time, but now then you can listen and uh, you start knowing things. Uh, somebody stands in front of you and they're lying. Uh, you know it. Right. Somebody stands in front of you and they say, oh, I'm fine. And you not only know they're not fine, you also know why, what's wrong, why they're not fine. Mm. And... Uh, and you start, you start having awarenesses that you didn't have before. Um, you wake up. Maybe for the first time in your life, you wake up. Mm. Yes, I think awakening is, is the other um, like general description that people have for this sort of thing. Yeah. They go, yeah, it, it kind of woke something up. Yeah. Um, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, and I, I, have, I know this story and I'm hearing it in a different way today, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. So thank you. Um, what, um, what, what's coming to me as well, uh, just coming a little bit off script and, and just saying, it sounds like, um, that there's a, an experience or experiences of, of healing that you've had 
either with uh, control remote viewing or, or with other other things in the energy realm, as it were. Yeah, many. Uh -huh. Can you um, can you give us one which might help, uh, help people? The, uh, okay, with CRV, uh, I had I had cracked a rib. I had broken a rib, and uh, uh, I was you know the medical way to treat a rib now is to not treat it at all. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes, true. <laughs> and, uh, so it was a Sunday afternoon and uh, I was hurting so bad. So and, painful. Uh, oh yeah. I was lying down and I drifted off to sleep and uh, I turned over and when I did, I hit that rib and it woke me up and and I just said, oh, hell, just heal. And I turned back over and went back to sleep. When I woke up, I didn't have a broken rib anymore. Uh, so that, I think, came from something that I had learned about, you know, through the remote viewing. Now, at another time in life, many years before this, uh, my son had the measles. I caught viral encephalitis from the measles. And at that time, it, uh, you had a 4% chance of survival if you made it to the hospital before you went into a coma. Well, I had been in a coma for eight hours before they got me to the hospital. And I had no chance of surviving. My wife called uh, home had the preacher break into our house and get our insurance papers to give to the hospital. And um, the doctor had told me that, or, or told Linda, I was in a coma, the doctor had told Linda that there was no chance of me making it through the night. I was dying. And uh, so he held a prayer meeting, called the entire church together and held a prayer meeting at two o'clock in the morning Later that morning, I sat up in the hospital bed. I had no idea where I was, but I could tell I was in a hospital. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, we must have been in a car wreck. And, you know, I wonder what happened to Linda. And, and I was about to panic. And about that time, the doctor walked in and saw me sitting there on the side of the bed and <laughs> excuse the language, he said, what the shit are you doing alive? Right. And I thought, am I supposed to apologize? <laughs> right. <laughs> you didn't actually know. But um, it was, I'm convinced, it was that group prayer. Yeah. That, you know, um, that saved my life. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's uh, I think there's certain you, you know, fairly um, believable, believable evidence that there is a power to prayer. But sadly, in the, the whole energy work area, right. yeah. scientifically proven work is mm -hmm. really, really rare to find. I, I was listening to the BBC, um, and there was a thing about bees being able to uh, feel color in the darkness and the the report the um, reporter from the BBC. So they said. So there's some evidence. Uh, so this sort of proves that bees have uh, have some consciousness. And the scientist said, there is no proof of consciousness. We haven't proved consciousness. I can't prove that I am conscious. That's and right. I thought, yeah. wonderful. Like you know, remember science. Like we can't. We've proved all this, but we can't actually prove our own consciousness. But right. actually CRV has got a lot of uh, scientific background, hasn't it? I mean, we're oh, talking yeah. about the controlled remote viewing that you're doing, not remote viewing, I should say. Yeah, remote viewing is the new age word for anything psychic, okay? Right. When it, when it became declassified and came out into the newspaper that controlled remote viewing was a scientifically proven thing, was developed in the laboratory. Yes. Uh, all of a sudden, every 
psychic became a remote viewer and we had home remote viewers and crystal ball remote viewers and tea leaf remote viewers and um, the controlled remote viewing is what was developed for the military <clears throat> in the laboratory and uh, it's called controlled not because the viewer is controlled in any way it's because we teach the viewer how to control the remote viewing. Hmm. So it's controlled remote viewing, not a viewer who is controlled. You know? Right. And, uh, and so uh, over the years, we have kept extensive databases, documentation, tried things, tried experiments, find out what does work, what doesn't work, and so on and uh, and then when we find something that does seem to work try it a thousand times and see what percentage of the time it does work and what time it fails and by doing all of this scientific databasing research testing and all that um over over all of these years the method has developed that uh that works uh, yeah it's a very rigorous method it's not easy to learn it's not something where you put the envelope to the forehead and say the answer is you know and uh if you get a even after you're uh fully experienced and fully trained in this you yeah. get a task you sit down and it may take you five hours to get the answer Going, right going through this method you know. and you've you've um i mean i think i suppose like for me i i want to draw people's attention that you've done quite a lot of um altruistic work for with police departments and uh mm -hmm. um other kinds of things where, where say they've they're looking to find a, a body or they're looking to find some evidence and there was um, Pat Price, wasn't he? That was one of the people that was was a policeman that that was. He was a policeman, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was part of that original uh, little group with with Ingo, wasn't he? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people could look. What What would you say if somebody is interested in um, just connecting with their energy? Is there is there something you'd say, or would you say like really my my area is control remote viewing? Uh, you, oh. This is this is my my portal to connecting with your energy. Yeah, um, I would say that, but um, I would also realize that if they want to connect with their energy, that's ultimately important, and so I would never put it down. But um, I generally tell people that um, uh, there are many ways to do that. So what you have to ask is why you want to do it. Hmm. Uh, do you want to go into police work or business work where you need 90% accuracy 90% of the time? Hmm. Or do you want to just know who's going to win a ball game so you can bet on it? Hmm. Or do you want to just find your car keys? Right. Um, you know? And, or do you want to just know that you're more than your physical body? And uh, that um, if you want to go the full distance and learn to do this operationally to help humanity, help find those missing kids, help find the evidence for the police, uh, help corporations do the correct business and, and so on. Uh, I, I tell people that learning controlled remote viewing is like joining the Marines. And if all you want to do is learn how to fold your underwear, don't, don't join the Marines to learn how to do it. <laughs> right. You know, there are other ways to learn how to fold your underwear. Right. Um, and there are easier uh, ways to um, learn to connect yourself. Yeah. To yourself, you know. Mm, mm. 
Now, I think you've been working quite a lot. Um, you know, I'm on the, you like you've, you've provided for me over years an enormous amount of support uh, on a personal level. Um, and then also with this, um, your website and, and your threads where people are able to ask questions. Um, but you've started like now to have um, a online learning portal. Has that started yet? Yes, uh -huh, it has, and uh, it's uh, you. You find it. You find the entrance to it on my website, um, which is crviewer.com. I think crviewer.com. Yeah. yeah. Um, all all one word. All one word. And, yeah. um, uh, the thing is, I was teaching small groups, which I preferred, yeah. and teaching the same thing over and over and over, year after year after year, uh, because it's a standardized method. Yeah. And so uh, I'm 80 years old now. I want to finally learn how to find the time to do my paintings do my poetry writing, do my writing, and uh, cut gemstones, which is a favorite hobby. I didn't and, know that. Oh, yes. I've got a garage full of, I've got cabinets out there full of raw gemstones that I've gone out and find, found, dug out of the ground over, over 30 years. And wow. they're sitting out there waiting to be cut. And... I want to come over and see your collection. <laughs> yeah, I just never get around to cutting them. Really. But uh, uh, it dawned on me that I'm never going to get anything that I want to do done if I'm constantly doing the same thing over and over and over. Yes. Uh, because I have found that uh, you have to have time with a teacher. Yes. Uh, it's like, reading a book on karate and going out and getting in a fight, <laughs> you're not going to win, right. uh, you know? Um, and so, uh, generally with each student that I have, I will spend from 100 to 300 hours after the class with that student. Hmm. So anyway, it dawned on me, I could put all of this stuff that's taught to every single class on videos. So uh, like for the basic class, I have over 160 videos. They're each very short. Each one is named for the one single aspect of CRV that it, that it addresses. And uh, they average about eight minutes long. But that way, if somebody wants to review what they found and they have a question, they don't have to wade through hour long videos to find the one thing that answers that question. You know? Right. Right. And so then each week, uh, each weekend, I have a webinar with the students who are having, the, who are taking the class and we go over their work. We go over all of their questions. We go over any, any questions they have about it and uh, anything they don't understand they get a fuller explanation. If they have a, a thing that works better for them, how can they fit it into the CRV method? And so we go over that and uh, we get on the webinar, we get them talking to each other, helping each other, picking targets for each other and, and such as that. We teach them how to teach good targets. Brilliant. And things like that. Yeah. You know. Right. So we have face to face time with the students, but all of the stuff that is standardized, taught to every class, they get on videos at their own speed. Lynn, that sounds fantastic. I was actually going to, I was being um, inspired to say, what's the future of remote viewing? But I feel like you just told me like this, there's, there's yeah. uh, mm -hmm. like a much more i mean you flew over to germany and, and stayed in the little town and, and visited me in my little home um for like five days you're incredibly generous with your time and knowledge and with everybody it was just like it was like um 
I, I imagine it's like meeting a Texas gentleman, you know, when you're from, you know, from England, you meet this like real gentle gentleman, like you're like right totally to wowed. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry to, to say it to your face because it's something that's so much nicer to hear behind your back, but uh, you know, it's just. Uh, my, my mama raised me good. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It was just, it really was impressive. And I, I experienced, I experienced the enormous, uh, negative response from psychologists, which I didn't expect. Oh, yeah. Psychologists seem to hate psychic things. Yeah, and I'm a psychologist now myself. I, I just couldn't understand it. But it was almost like um, uh, undermining their, their credibility, which, which I don't see right. at all. Um, but going back to my original question, like, wh what, do you, what do you see as the future of remote viewing? Do you feel it's dying or do you feel it's... it's having a renaissance i think the i think as as crb proves itself and the takeoffs that are learning from crb and picking up some of the tools that we use as they prove themselves um it's it's going to grow and all of the fluff and the woo woo and the mysticism and all that all that's dying off, and rightfully so, you know. Um, it's about time it does. Mm. Um, there is nothing woo-woo, nothing mystical about controlled remote viewing. Uh, you don't go into trances, uh, any of that. Well, you know, you've, you've done remote viewing sessions. You've learned remote viewing. Uh, yeah, I, but you, I would say it's a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> how much woo-woo woo -woo did i teach you <laughs> oh well now that's a different question like you're you're like um i always say what i what, what attracted to me um what attracted me to you when i was learning about the different teachers out there was was you were a sergeant and i knew that in military units sergeants are the teachers sergeants are the the guys that are looking after their boys yeah they're they're the the the, the mothers of of everyone yeah, sure. and um, and they're they're responsible for making things go right. And then you've got officers, sort of. I won't say anything bad about officers, but they're kind of like more, um, you know. The, well, you have the officers because somebody needs to take the credit. Right, um, and then really you 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 you're almost military and like okay, this is step one. Step one consists of, and it was very 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 structured. What yes. what I feel um, is woo woo is, is just you get results that you can't explain. Like mm -hmm. how did I know that? Um, That's right. And then um, and then feeling like like I haven't had by location, but almost had. You know, like feel I feel like I'm I am somewhere else, but I think it's more like an aesthetic impact. Sorry, I'm, I'm talking now jargon, or I felt like I'm actually here. And then when I got the got the target and I've seen the target, I went. I knew that I knew I didn't write it down, but I knew that. Um, yeah. Sorry. And then your sergeant says, why didn't you write it down? Right. Right. Yeah. I, I know. I knew that as well. <laughs> well, Lynn, I'm, I'm going to draw it to a close. I, I'm normally planning these, um, these interviews for about an hour because, uh, okay. you know, I feel that people, um, I, I mean, I could talk to you all day, um, but, I think people they're attracted to something which isn't too long. Um, and, um, uh, I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for being my teacher and, and being an incredible, uh, support person. Um, and, uh, thank you in, uh, how can I say uh, for everybody for taking your time and, and talking to me and everybody and, uh, for sharing so openly and directly the the no bullshit the no bullshit uh just straight out straight out with the texan approach yeah. i'd like to thank you for all you've done with this and for all you've done with the energy work you're doing the uh the martial arts that you do uh that is that is what's called raising the level of the ocean and it raises all the ships at sea. <laughs> and, you know, 
I think that raises the level of humanity is the work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank you, sir.